Cracks in China's economy are getting harder for Beijing to ignore. As a crumbling real estate market and fallout from China's zero COVID strategy start to hit where it hurts, signs of a policy change have some saying things this could be a turning point. But will it be enough to stop the downward slide of the world's second largest economy? I'm Christy Platson in Berlin with your DW Business Special. And joining me today, we have George Magnus. He's an associate at, Oxf at Oxford University's China Center. George, thank you so much for joining us today. Now, now you've also written a book, Red Flags, uh, Red Flags, Why Xi Jinping's China is in Jeopardy. Uh, love the title, by the way. Love a good pun. Um, so before we jump into this week's news, you published this book back in 2018 already. So what red flags were jumping out at you at that time? The, the big issues that I think were already pretty evident at that time were Firstly, how China was going to deal with its kind of mounting burden of debt, um, to which it had become increasingly addicted. Uh, so it had had a very successful economic development model for many years, but eventually, um, as it always happens with emerging countries, it gives way, needs to change, and and the and the government was very reluctant to change. So. Uh, the debt burden was one of the red flags. The demographics were another because China is the fastest aging country on uh, the, in the planet. Uh, not the oldest, but the fastest aging. Uh, the third big uh, flag, red flag, was uh, productivity. So after decades of very rapid productivity growth, it had actually stalled. Um, and then uh, there were kind of other ones that were looming, like changes in governance. So you know, uh, Xi Jinping's China was becoming much more kind of uh, Leninist in terms of its approach to politi politics and to economic management. Um, and then, of course, the external environment was uh, was already in 2018-19, um, had already succumbed to President Trump's trade war. Since then, of course, it's become much worse and much more um, involved. So those are the red flags, basically. Right. Well, I mean, since then, we've, we, we have seen or it's seeming like the high paced growth that China had been seeing some years ago is starting to come to an end. And we've had more developments on top of the ones you just mentioned, um, COVID lockdowns, Russia's war against Ukraine, trade disputes with the West. These have all put severe restraints on Chinese economic growth. So if we take a look at the figures in 2010, the economy grew more than 10 percent. But growth has been slowing ever since then. It was particularly low in 2020 when the pandemic effect really started to bite in China and oh, around the globe, I should say. Uh, the growth rate this year will be 3.2 percent, according to a Reuters poll of analysts. Uh, so this is not even close to the government's target of 5.5 percent. And China has said it needs to maintain growth at that rate if it's going to provide enough jobs for all the young people who want to enter uh, the labor market. So, George, a passive China watcher might take a look at the last 10 years and think that China has actually been doing really well. We've seen um, a, a lot of interesting things coming out of there, the Belt and Road Initiative, which is, a, of course, an inf infrastructure development project going on around the world. Also, in terms of, of tech, we've seen TikTok, Huawei, ride-hailing apps. We've seen China's central bank really pushing the digital currencies trend. Um, but if we look at these economic growth numbers, this is painting a different picture of, of China. So could you break down this contradiction for me? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's really important that you should mention that and also for us all to sort of contextualize, right? So number one, China is the second biggest economy in the world measured in, uh, well, measured in the way most people would measure it, which is in, in current US dollar terms. There are other ways of measuring it, but let's not get into the, the long grass there. So it's the second biggest economy in the world. So it's around 17 to 18 trillion dollars in size. Um, it's the biggest export nation in the world. Um, it's, uh, you know, got a very a sort of highly educated urban workforce. Um, it's capable of creating and is creating a lot of advanced technologies in things like mobile payments, for example. It's probably a world leader. Everybody's heard of some of the big Chinese companies like Huawei, for example. So, you know, we're not talking about um, a basket case developing country here. Um, uh, but there is a contradiction, uh, as you point out, because within that context, um, China's growth model, its development model, is basically has run into a brick wall. Um, and there's a problem here because 
very successful countries uh, often get into this or frequently get into this problem, this uh, situation where uh, the success of the development model, you know, is not eternal. It has to be changed sometimes. It runs, it needs, it has new requirements. It needs to be rebooted. But of course, the problem with change is that you need very flexible institutions um, and mm -hmm. consensus uh, to be able to make important changes in the way in which your economy and your politics work. The trouble in China, of course, is that the Communist Party is very rigid in its view and very controlling in its attitude to everything from industry to the economy, society and everything you can think of. So the problem, if I want to kind of encapsulate it really, is that China's development model on which the legitimacy of the Communist Party is based uh, at home and also to some degree uh, in the big wide world, that development model is ha is no longer fit for purpose. And it's very there isn't really an alternative. The government knows it has to be changed, but they're not really willing or able to take the political measures to really be able to change it in the way that we would normally expect. Well, so talking a little bit more specifically about people in China for a second. Uh, now, we heard yesterday that um, Alibaba, which is basically China's Amazon, reported major losses. And this is um, often seen or Alibaba is often seen as a reflection of consumer sentiment in China. So that's not really you know, giving the best impression. For regular Chinese people, what is life like for them in China right now? Well, uh, it's it's pretty tough in a way. I mean, obviously there are there is no one China, right? There are uh, lots of people uh, who have uh, living standards, income per head, the same as, for example, Portugal. Many of these people live in the coastal cities, for example, that tourists go and visit or used to go and visit before COVID. Um, hopefully we'll do again. Um, but there is also a China which is uh, the so-called backwater. So the rural areas, uh, the sort of central areas, some of the central areas, the northeast, the west of China. Here, income, uh, living standards and income per head are really still quite low. So um, what is life like for Chinese consumers? It kind of depends where you are in China. For uh, urban consumers, let's say in Beijing or Shanghai, it's kind of rough, but not kind of the end of the world. It's rough because they've had to succumb to um, the disciplines of zero COVID and frequent lockdowns and so on. It's rough because um, the hospitality, leisure, entertainment industries, for example, service industries, haven't really been able to function. The property market has rolled over after like 20 years of boom. Um, so things are looking a little bit tougher for, you know, if you're poorer, if you happen to be on the kind of low end of the income distribution, you live in a, you're a, a migrant, one of 300 uh, migrant workers in Chinese cities, uh, and you don't get access to free education, uh, social services, healthcare, and so on. Um, yeah, things are, not that great, to be honest. The, the consumer is having a bit of a rough time. Well, you know, many consumers are. Yeah, certainly. And I mean, I'm sure the zeroed COVID strategy China's pursued um, isn't making life more comfortable com comfortable for them. Now, I mean, Beijing has indicated it, it would perhaps ease these restrictions slightly, but experts are saying that it's not going to mean uh, make a whole lot of difference, um, at least in the shorter midterm here. How much pain has the zero COVID strategy caused for China or for Chinese people? How would you respond to that question? Oh, quite quite a lot, and I think you know social media have certainly been has been full uh, in recent months of um, video clips that people have posted about lockdowns in Shanghai or in um, uh, Guangzhou at the moment or in other you know cities um, where people and you know and long lines for testing uh, where people have to be tested twice or three times. Um, a day or in, you know, frequently during the week, and obviously the regime is quite rough. So it, it is being relaxed a little bit, um, or it has been uh, during the last couple of weeks, and this has given rise to speculation that there may be, you know, these are the baby steps that the government needs to take to eventually um, leave behind and abandon zero COVID, perhaps next March or April. We'll see. Um, I mean, so far, uh, it doesn't look like the government has a really sort of coherent plan because if you really want to leave zero COVID behind, you have to have lots of mRNA vaccines, you have to vaccinate the over uh, 60s and the over 80s, 
only about 40% of the over 80s have been vaccinated. Um, you have to have plenty of hospital capacity to deal with um, uh, ICU cases, I mean, emergency cases, especially for older citizens. None of this is in situ yet. So um, I think it'll be quite some time before China really leaves zero COVID behind. But they may, if they have a decent winter and the caseload doesn't increase too much, uh, they may be able to carry on uh, relaxing the, the policy, um, but they also may not if uh, if things get out of hand. So the next few weeks, I think, will be very telling. Now, George, making a, making a jump to a more international perspective now, we um, obviously saw energy markets going into turmoil earlier this year after Russia invaded Ukraine. Um, this has created a lot of conversation, a lot of anxieties in Western countries about uh, be, being over, overly reliant on certain countries for certain things, for example, like uh, the EU's dependence on Russia for gas and oil. Um, these same anxieties are now popping up about dependencies on China. I'd like your thoughts on this in just a second. But first, DW spoke with with Siemens CEO Roland Bush this week about what resilience against such dependencies means for his company. But we have to acknowledge that resilience is also, has also a price. So therefore, it is worthwhile investing now in new markets and diversifying, but on top, on top of what we do in China. So for me, this is also the strategy what Siemens is doing, that we can continue investing in, in China. We want to keep or even increase our market share there. There's nothing bad about it, taking the chances we have, but at the same time looking into other markets with a stronger focus and grow our business there too. Now, George, in your opinion, is China worried about uh, the talks of, of moving into other markets aside from China? Um, I, I think they are. I think they should be. Um, not there's as the you know as you've just heard i mean i don't know whether siemens is representative of you know tens of thousands of companies that are in china i should think it has a um, pretty big um, um say as uh, or kind of represents certainly what what big companies think which is you know they don't want to leave china they still see virtue and uh, value in increasing their revenues and uh, taking advantage of the the growth in the chinese market but all companies, I think, are having to reconsider uh, their reliance on sole source suppliers, you know, particularly inside China, and of becoming caught in the crosshairs of geopolitics, where they may have to choose. And companies are not in business to do this, but they are and may have to choose more about whose rules and regulations they're going to follow and whose rules and regulations they're going to flout. They, in other words, they won't follow. Um, and that's because of the, uh, not just because of the sanctions regimes that have been introduced over Xinjiang province, over the treatment of uh, Hong Kong, over um, you know, risk of secondary sanctions on companies in China, if they break uh, primary sanctions against uh, Russia. Um, but also, of course, in the future, if things should go really horribly wrong in terms of international relations and China were to threaten or become bellicose over Taiwan, the likelihood is very strong that there will be um, huge changes in uh, policies by the United States, probably the EU as well, I would say, uh, in terms of its uh, trade and commercial and political relations with, with China. And so, you know, it's, it's prudent for companies to be able to, to now kind of look at other countries in Asia and beyond uh, for changing the supply chains that have taken decades to, to build up. It won't happen quickly, but I'm pretty sure it is starting to happen now. Yeah, certainly the situation in Ukraine has everyone looking at Taiwan um, for just the reasons you, you just said. Well, so switching gears again, um, another major development this week uh, had to do with China's real estate market. So to, zo to zoom in on that for a second here, the China housing market crash is, oh, pardon me one second here. The China housing market crash um, is threatening 
to expand into a wider financial crisis. The country's largest property developers like Evergrande are sagging under large debt burdens, and consumers are lo um, losing their investments in failed construction projects. More and more people are reluctant to buy new homes. And that's why prices for newly built houses are falling. November last year, prices of a newly built home uh, was three, were 3 percent higher than a year earlier. Houses seem to be a good investment, but the latest figure from October this year shows that prices for newly built homes are down 1.6 percent. It was the sixth straight month of decreases in new home prices and the fastest fall since 2015. This is really bad news for the economy as the real estate sector accounts for about 30 percent of China's GDP. Uh, now, so George, back to you. Talking about housing being a good investment for people in China, I understand it's also one of the only options uh, for investing for, for people there. What role does home ownership play in China? What's the culture around that? It's pretty big. Um, I mean, basically, households hold their wealth, really, in only two ways. One is in the form of property, and the other is in the form of bank deposits. So there isn't really that sort of financial infrastructure that I'm sure, you know, a lot of the citizens in richer countries are quite accustomed to and don't even think about, really, which is the investments that they may either hold directly in stocks and in bonds or through insurance um, policies or through asset management companies and so on. So obviously the Chinese financial authorities hope that in time foreign financial firms will bring know-how and capital to China to help Chinese citizens uh, diversify the way in which they hold their wealth. But for the moment, most of Chinese wealth is held in the form of, of property. So that means that when prices are falling and when the, the market is in, uh, in a pretty dire state, which it is now, and actually uh, prices are falling much more quickly in so-called tier three and tier four cities, which are lower administratively uh, kind of ranked cities than say Beijing or Shenzhen, for example, or Shanghai. Right. Um, so these cities where most of the housing stock is and where most of the overcapacity exists are seeing price declines much bigger than the, uh, the numbers that you mentioned. And so it's yeah. really important uh, for the government to try to stabilize this if it can. Right. Well, uh, hopping off of that point, China has introduced this 16-point plan exactly to do this, to stabilize the property market. It, it's um, empowering regulators and the central bank to promote the stable and healthy development of a sector that generates um, as much as a third of gross, dom gross domestic product. The measures include support for overstretched housing developers. The government wants to make sure that pre-sold projects are finished to avoid protests by mortgage holders. There will be deferred payment loan options for home buyers and lower mortgage down payments, also looser purchasing rules on first homes by new city dwellers. Yeah, I mean, these measures um, are precisely the antithesis of the kinds of things the government was trying to do in 2020 and 2021 when Xi Jinping was very adamant about, you know, houses are for living in, not for Hello? Yeah, sorry, George. Yeah, go on. Yeah? Yep. I think we might have lost. Do we have George still? Yeah, yeah, I'm still here. I just got, I was just mid flow when somebody <laughs> said, Can you hear me? Ah, uh, sorry. Well, can you pick up your flow again there? You were talking about this being the opposite of, uh, uh, you can carry on. I, I was with you. Okay, so... Okay, wait, sorry. Uh, Quick question. So just pa pause, George. We're going to start over um, from my little introduction, and then we'll just go back into it, okay? Okay. All right. No worries. Wait one second, guys. Okay, so I'll just start up here with... Yeah. Well, China has introduced a 16-point plan to do exactly this, to stabilize the property market. Um, it empowers regulators and the central bank to promote the, quote, stable and healthy development of a sector that generates as much as a third of gross domestic product in China. The measures include support for overstretched housing developers. The government wants to make sure pre-sold projects are actually finished to avoid protests by mortgage holders. There will be deferred payment loan options for home buyers and lower mortgage down payments, also lower, looser purchasing rules on first homes by new city dwellers. George, what's your reaction to this plan? <laughs> 
because it's really it's the antithesis of pretty much everything the government was trying to do in 2020 and 2021 when Xi Jinping insisted that uh, housing was for living in, not for speculation. So we had these huge uh, and quite important restraints imposed on developers um, and on housing conditions and mortgage conditions and so on. But uh, the pain looks to have been too much for the authorities, and I think they've now backtracked and have tried to alleviate some of that pain for developers and for mortgage holders. But, of course, the problem is most of the measures that have been announced in this 16-point plan will try to, it'll stretch out uh, the problems that are being faced by local governments, property developers and mortgage owners, but it won't solve the problem of rein reinvigorating demand for housing and um, the kind of momentum that the market was used to before. So I think I think the effect, if it has any effect, will be temporary, and the long-term or medium-term implications for the housing market are still pretty bearish, actually, largely because well, you know there's too much debt, falling prices, and um, the uh, the demographic of first-time buyers looks pretty awful. Well, yeah, George, just uh, to, to wrap up, my last question would, would be exactly off of that. If you don't see these moves reinvigorating uh, China, what developments do you see on the horizon and what might that mean for the rest of the world? Well, I think that what we have to get used to is a China that's going to grow by about two and a half to three percent over the next 10 years rather than you know, 10%, which is kind of what people think they still might get back to, or 8% sometimes people say. But it's going to be much more pedestrian in the future. And the only question really is not whether China will grow more slowly, but whether it'll be a kind of a relatively more or less stable environment. And that depends very much on the kinds of uh, policies the government takes to try to change the way in which growth is generated. If it tries to keep pump priming the economy with infrastructure and real estate, um, it's not going to look very pretty, to be honest. If it tries to move more towards consumers and service industries, which would require political change, which is a tall order, um, that might be a lot better. But I think the odds at the moment are not very favorable for that outcome. Well, we're going to have to leave it there for now. But, George, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the show. This was George Magnus, China expert at Oxford University. And if uh, you'd like to add some context to our talk today, I would encourage you to check out the latest episode of DW's Business Beyond, which looks at the likelihood of the next global recession in 2023 and why this time it's personal. I'm Christy Platson from DW Business. Till next time, take care.